Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 2008 release of Bad Biology and is a Frank Henenlotter film. Now I know you may be saying, oh, Frank Henenlotter, that sounds kind of familiar. Well, it would if you've seen such films as Basket Case, well, any three of the Basket Case films, uh, Brain Damage, Frank and Hooker, films like that. So this is another one of his films. So if you've seen those other films or even one of those other films, you kind of understand what Frank Henenlotter's um, style is directorially and writing because he does a lot of his own writing. Although he did have some help with the script for this film, which makes me wonder why it's, or makes me wonder if that's why this is not his best film. This is actually the worst film of his that I've seen, to be honest. And um, I think part of that may have been because he didn't just write it himself. All the other films he wrote himself and they are fun. Good, Not like, oh my gosh, these are amazing films, but in the, in the sense of like awesomely bad films, awesomely bad. Actually a little more than bad. Like some of the stuff is actually like good, good. Anyway, so like I said, directed by Frank Henenlotter, written by Henenlotter, and also R.A. the Rugged Man, who is actually a rapper. So because of that, he was able to actually get some good music for the film, which was really good by, you know, he made a song for it. And then also he got like, Someone I'm familiar with, Jedi Mind Tricks. He also got Kill a Priest and 60 Second Assassin, who are known to me as well. But I was most impressed with Jedi Mind Tricks because I think their stuff is good. And actually, at least one of the dudes from Jedi Mind Tricks was in the film. I think maybe more. I wasn't paying super close attention to that because the one guy was actually pointed out. But this film actually came after Hen and Lauder was hired to do a music video for Rugged Man, and then they kind of were talking, and then Rugged Man was like, hey, I, do you want to make a movie? I kind of want to make a movie. So he bankrolled it, from what I understand, Rugged Man did, and they um, they sat down together, they worked on the script, and they executed the film together. So uh, I, I assume this film would not have happened had it not been for that, but I also don't know if that would have mattered really because I don't really think this is a very good film. There are some good ideas there and there are some things in the film that I really did like, which I'll obviously talk about, but there are some things that just, I mean, I just wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um, if you're a completist as far as Hen and Lauder goes, I would be like, yes, you should see it once and that's probably as much as you're going to want to see it. Although there might be some people out there who really loved it. And if that's you, put some comments down here. I want to know why. So Char Charlie Danielson, who plays Jennifer in this film, who's initially the main character because it kind of starts from her perspective and is focusing solely on her until you get to the male lead, Bats. And then it becomes really uneven, but I'll talk about that. Anyway, uh, she was uh, Rugged Man's girlfriend at the time and was like, oh, I want to do acting. So she, you know, just got the part. Honestly, um, there's not good acting in this overall. But uh, I think of the actors in it, I think she was one of the better ones, to be honest. So she actually did a pretty solid job for what the acting was for the film. So I'm not saying she's like a great actress or anything or even like a good actress. It's just she was less bad than a bunch of other people. Um, Anthony Sneed, who was also one of the better actors in it, uh, he played Bats. Uh, and he was actually found, he, f he found a call for the acting job through Craigslist which, you know, that's kind of like a funny thing now. But I will be honest, I've done short film in the past before, and I use Craigslist, Craigslist to find actors, so it, is, it was a thing. Um, I don't know if it is so much anymore. But anyway, Sneed had answered the call. He wanted the role badly. Hen and Lauder passed on him because he was like, your physique looks too good, and you're supposed to kind of have like a bit of a uh, junky vibe to you, like drug addict vibe. He's like, so you're just like, you look too good physically. So Sneed went and he lost 30 pounds in 30 days, came back, and then Hen Lauder was like, wow, that's dedication and you look the part now, so the part is yours. Now, let me say that losing 30 pounds in 30 days is probably not very healthy, uh, but he did it for the role. Also, I don't know how much this helped his career, let's be honest. The beginning animation with the magnified, or magnified organisms while the credits are playing in the beginning, it looks fine, but it goes on way too long. It's like there's kind of nothing going on. You're just like, okay, let's move. Let's get to the film. That's a minor, minor issue, though. The cinematography, 
the cinematography of it overall looks pretty solid, but it also looks made for TV movie ish and uh, specifically Skinamax type stuff because it is kind of like a softcore porn in a sense. There is so much sex worked into this, which I understand from the perspective of that's kind of what the whole story's about, that's what the whole script is about. But the amount of, like, actual sex that they put into it is gratuitous. Like, you don't need it, and you should. it, it just should have been dialed back a lot. Mainly because it would have meant more, it would have been more impactful for the actual film if you use it correctly instead of just being, like, people banging, people banging, people banging, people banging. It just loses its luster. Not from the point of, like, seeing it and being like, oh, that's arousing, but from the point of it, like, making a point with the story. Um, less is more with a lot of things, and this is one of those things. It, it seemed just gratuitous to the point of just, like, we want more nudity in it. We want more sex in it. So, I don't know how much of that was Hen and Lauder. I don't know how much of that was Rugged Man, but I don't know. Um... <laughs> Uh, that's one hell of an orgasm to make you unintentionally kill someone, I put, to to start this whole thing out. Uh, Jennifer, she's, you know, obviously this person who has a very specific genetic makeup that you see, uh, and she, you know, has this crazy sexual appetite that she goes after, and her orgasms are so intense that she doesn't understand that she's killing the guy in the beginning when she's having sex with him, and then she leaves his body after having having the baby um i was gonna say abortion it's not really an abortion but she is leaving it she was she's having the baby because that's that's how her anatomy works like she has sex once she's immediately pregnant and has to have this malformed baby that looks crazy and i'm surprised they actually showed it but you can tell it's cg so it's like it kind of looked good for cg kind of didn't i don't know so she leaves it in the bathtub and i was just like what wouldn't she be caught? Like, she would definitely be caught because she left the dead body and she left the aborted baby and that's her genetic material. So, like, they would be able to find out who the mother of that was and she would at least be questioned at that point because of the dead body. So, um, yeah, their plot hole, um, plot holes. Although, you know, the subject matter of this is probably okay for plot holes, I, I would assume. You don't you don't take it too seriously. Um, Hen and Lot are shooting in a scrapyard again. There is that scene in the scrapyard where she's kind of doing like a, an erotic photo shoot, which I assume that's what her job is. Although, how is she making money doing that? <clears throat> I know we see at one point that like, I guess she's selling those photos, but like, is she getting, I, I'm not clear on it, is she getting like specific instructions on what types of shoots to do because it seemed more like she was just doing whatever she wanted to do and then just going around and being like hey this has nudity in it do you want to purchase these photos like can you make a living doing that i assume no so that seems kind of weird with this but we'll, we'll just go with it we'll just go with it but anyway so one of her shoots is in the scrapyard early on and it was funny to me because they show a, you know, kind of a decent amount of the scrapyard. And it just made me think to Hen and Lauder's film Brain Damage, where he shot in a scrapyard. And a lot of the kind of like camera work he does in the scrapyard looks pretty similar to in Brain Damage. And actually, the camera work in the scrapyard is the best cinematography in the actual film, in my opinion. It looked really good, to be honest. There were some cool, interesting shots like through things, especially the one where she was like, masturbating in the car with the uh, hole in the windshield and they were shooting her face through the windshield. It looked it looked good. Uh, the internal vaginal shot is totally wacky. Uh, and it looks like, I guess they had like these alien kind of looking eggs just like waiting inside of her uterus. I don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's, it looks crazy. You didn't think the film was going to go there, but then again, this is Frank Henenlotter, so... You also don't see it going to seeing, like, the gigantic semi-animatronic penis uh, at the, well, towards the halfway mark, I guess, to three quarters. But anyway, um, that was just a crazy scene. Um, and, I mean, it it looked interesting, and it kind of gave you a, a more of a feel of, like, this woman being more alien than anything. And I think that's kind of part of what this plays on is, you know, people feeling outcast, which... You know, if you look at all of Hen and Lauder's films, like, all his stuff is very outcast. You know, Basket Case, 
very outcast brain damage this guy feels very outcast um and uh frankenhooker you know a mad scientist outcast type guy and all of the films have some degree to do with drugs and drug addiction this one obviously does as well which i'm going to talk about in a little bit um when we were first introduced to the guy bats which is a weird name for a character um his dick kind of like flopping around under his underwear it looked like a fish flopping and it actually was pretty funny and especially when he then like is like mad at it. he's like yo stay still and he like duct tapes it down uh that was funny i like those kind of smaller comedic moments in the film like that and that's that was definitely one of them um I put Bats is like a mad jerk off scientist with his industrial fleshlight that he made. That thing is crazy. I also think that that scene goes on way too long. Uh, it's it's just another one of those things. Like that gets lumped in with the, all the sex and nudity stuff. Like just being way too much of it to to really like have an impact because you're just oversaturating the audience with that stuff. Um, so that scene in particular just goes on too long. It's funny though. I found it kind of funny. Uh, but it also kind of makes the point that, like, there's no person he can have sex with, and obviously his hand isn't going to do it. So he had to build, like, this industrial flesh, like like I said, to, to take care of things, if you will. So how Jennifer is making money doing these shoots, I don't know, or is it just for her? Um, that Yeah, that actually goes to the point where, you know, like I said before, like, she's doing these photo shoots, and then she's going to try and sell the photos, but I don't think she was initially getting direction on them. I think she really is just shooting whatever she wants to shoot for kind of her own gratification, um, creatively and sexually. And then she's seeing if anyone's interested in it after the fact. Now, I would have liked if they would have gone down that path a little bit more to kind of explain that and her artwork. Because they have some very interesting uh, photos that she has in the very beginning that, that one of her crew members is looking at. And getting more into that would have been really nice, but I feel like her character gets pretty much abandoned as soon as you meet Bats. Like, the script is very uneven, and it doesn't kind of flesh out a lot of the things that should be fleshed out, which I feel like Hen and Lauder typically does take care of that in his films. Like, Basket Case, Prank and Hooker, Brain Damage, like, he gives you enough backstory, he gives you enough story development and what's going on. This one, it seems very half-baked. Uh, half finished kind of and the fact that Jennifer seems to be such an important character and then she's just pretty much abandoned and then is just like barely there after we meet Bats doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me they should have stuck with her a little bit more well a lot more uh, when the giant dong is revealed it is very funny it looks good too let's be honest I mean it looks like a monster and that like a veiny pulsating monster which comes in handy later when it detaches and goes on its raping rampage basically um and by the way that scene is hilarious because when it's like busting through the floorboards and like busting through drywall like that's what's funny that is hilarious about it but but it looked good the way they made it up pretending to have an orgasm for that long has got to be exhausting i mean i was exhausted watching it where bats has sex with the actual regular human and then she's just, like, having an orgasm forever, and he, like, flips out and calls his drug dealer friend to, like, get some advice on what to do. Like, I was, like, astounded with how long this fake orgasm was going on. Well, I mean, not fake in the film, but fake in real life. But just, like, I was uh, amazed that this actress was able to keep doing this. Like, that is crazy exhausting, I assume, because, like I said, I was exhausted watching it. And this is another one of those things in the film that it just goes on too long. It's, like... You've made your point minutes ago. Why are we still doing this? Well, let's move on, please. Beverly Bonner is in this film, and that is awesome. Now, if people don't know, Beverly Bonner started out in the first Basket Case film, and she has been in every Henenlotter film since. Uh, and in this film, her credited name, her, her character's name in IMDb is Casey Belial. For people who don't get that, Belial is the detached uh, Siamese twin from Basket Case. Um, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. Just to see her, as soon as I saw her, I was like, oh, that's awesome, it's Beverly, that's so cool. And then the, to find out that her name in it is Casey Belisle. She plays the neighbor who, you know, is hearing too much noise in Bats' place. So I thought that was cool. The schlong monster looks pretty gnarly, 
and it hammering its way through the houses is funny. I did like that aspect of it. Like I said, like the smaller comedic moments work well in this film, but eh. I went on a binge. Uh, I'm sorry. It went on a binge and lost all its, all its juice, it basically seems like. As soon as it got free, it just started satiating its sexual desires, its sexual hunger, and it just went crazy. And then when it's found by Jennifer and Bats, it's like it's dying, basically, because it lost all its essence. It lost its juice. And then, you know... Jennifer's trying to bring it back, and that is successful, and then then we have the end, which I didn't really, you know, I didn't have any feeling about. Like, it, it was this thing of, like, drawing a parallel between, like, her final sexual um, fulfillment being tied into, like, having sex with God or something, like, it being a religious experience. And it's like, I mean, I get that, but it's dumb. Like I, I it, and they didn't work on that enough. They made reference to it much earlier in the film, but they didn't work that angle enough. And that's that's one of the things. Like it, the the script's kind of all over the place. It's very sparse with the actual story, so it's you know it's not that great. Uh, and then there's a song playing during the credits. If you really pay attention to the lyrics, this is a song by R.A. the Rugged Man, and it is pretty funny because it's a comedic, I assume fictitious telling of making the film with Frank Henenlotter. In fact, he drops Henenlotter's name in the lyrics, which I thought was kind of cool. So, um, th that song is good. And the music's good in the film, I will say that. So here's my, you know, final thoughts on the, on the film. Uh, the dialogue is very over the top and gets run to the point of exhaustion. Yeah, the dialogue's not well written. <clears throat> like I said, it gets run to exhaustion. There are times where I think they were letting people improvise and they just let them go too much and it's not working. Um, I feel like there's just, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like there's just not enough real content in this film to justify it actually being a film. It needed more actual story to it. It needed to be fleshed out more, and it's an hour and 25 minutes, so it's not, like, long, but it's, it feels like there's not an hour and 25 minutes there. It feels like maybe there's 45 minutes there, to be honest. Maybe. Maybe even half an hour, I don't know. The idea behind the genital abnormalities create a feeling of being uniquely outcast from society. And this is something that Hen and Lauder does a lot. And Jennifer talks about it in her opening dialogue. Similar ideas, uh, this is a similar idea with Dwayne and Belial in Basket Case. But if you can look at it, you know, everyone is an outcast, pretty much the main characters of Hen and Lauder films. Brain Damage, Frankenhooker, Basket Case, all that stuff. And there's also, like, monsters involved a lot of the time, to some degree. And there's always that drug addiction, like I was talking about. Approaching sexual pr pleasure from a different perspective is interesting in this. Always horny and giving birth after sex uh, is being more orgasmic than the actual sex. It's kind of a crazy concept. So I like how they kind of reimagined people's roles for sex, for reproducing, and, you know, for fulfilling their desires. But, like I said, like, there's just not enough story there, though. Like, they needed to flesh that out a lot more. Uh, it's a good concept. Just the execution. This is also a typical role reversal in film with the woman being the sexual seeker, at least in the beginning. I mean, Bats then is, although he actually really tries to keep his sexual desires under wraps for the most part, Jennifer is just very much like, let's go. So her being the sexual aggressor, is more of like a flipping the script, so to speak, and making it, you know, the woman going after it and voraciously. It reminds me of, like, the film Species. Like, this actually reminded me a lot of the film Species, of, you know, a woman being being an alien and she needs to mate with these human men because Jennifer doesn't even feel human. Like, she kind of has dialogue that, you know, makes you believe from her perspective that she, do she doesn't even, like, feel like she fits in with other people because of what goes on with her biology, bad biology. Hen and Lauder has a thing for people dealing with monsters, which are metaphors for real life issues. This is self medic in this one it's self medication and drug addiction, much like in brain damage, but also the fight to control your libido. I think that's kind of another thing they were really going at um, and showing kind of the two different sides of the coin where Jennifer is fighting against her libido, but she's not fighting very hard because she's kind of just going for it. And then Bats is really fighting against his libido and trying to suppress it by basically being a junkie in a sense. And that kind of speaks to how people deal with real life problems, you know, 
trauma, PTSD, anxiety, whatever, by self-medicating with drugs. So I think it's kind of, you know, playing on that. The backstory on Bats having his dick cut off when he was born is a parallel with Dwayne in Basket Case. Dwayne lost his twin connection because of doctors, and Bats lost his dick because of doctors, both traumatizing separations for a young kid's development. So I think it's kind of making the point, much like in Basket Case, that he's been messed up for life because of what the doctors did to him very early on in life. And when that stuff isn't fixed early on, it's... Um, it becomes very traumatic and it really messes someone up. So then it sends them down a very bad path. Now that plays out in Basket Case and that plays out obviously in Bad Biology. So I found that very interesting to kind of make that connection. So that's kind of all I have to say about the film. Uh, it's probably a lot more than a lot of people have said about the film because, because let's be honest, I don't know many people actually like it. When most people talk about Bad Biology, they just are just like, that's a movie, yeah. So, like I said, I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm going to rate it on the two scale. Since it's a Henelotter fi film, I'm going to rate it twice on my two scales. On, like, actual is it a good film scale and then the so bad it's good scale. So, on the is it a good film, uh, all, you know, both these scales, possible five stars with half stars in play. The overall film scale, I'd give it one star out of five. Uh, it's not good. Um, but out of the so bad it's good, I would actually give it two stars because there, there are some good ideas there. There's some funny stuff there. There's quirkiness to it, obviously. I mean, it's a Hen and Lauder film, so, you know. But um, I wouldn't watch this again, to be honest. Well, I guess I would if I'm, like, introducing other people to it, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't really choose to watch it again. It's a, it's a one-and-done type thing. Um, One-night stand for me. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah. But anyway, if you're a big Hen and Lauder fan, you should see it. But anyway, let's talk about it in the comments. Do you feel differently about it? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. If you like any reviews that I do, any videos at all, that's your best way to repay me. And if you want to know when my videos are coming out and when the live streams are going up, make sure you hit the notification bell after you hit the subscribe. Uh, if you've already subscribed, hit that thumbs up just to let me know you're still watching. Uh, but regardless, thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.